I think we are in good company tonight with a prosecutor with a record like that. Vincent Bugliosi, come on up, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you so much for coming here tonight uh, to hear me talk about my book, The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder. The amount of time to getting out the message of my book to the people of this country. And that's Eileen Proctor. Please give her a big hand. <laughs> Busy since the book came out. In my book, The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder, I present evidence that proves beyond all reasonable doubt that George Bush took this nation to war on a lie under false pretenses and therefore under the law. He is guilty of murder for the deaths of over 4,000 young American soldiers who died so far in his war. You notice I said his war, not your war, not my war, not America's war, but George Bush's war. Now, I realize I'm fully aware that the charge I've just made is an extremely serious one. But if there's one thing about me that I do take pride in, I never, ever, ever make a charge without making or offering a substantial amount of support for that charge. Uh, you may end up disagreeing with what I say, but you're going to be forced to concede or you're going to have to concede that I offer much evidence in support of my position, something that people don't always do. I assume that most of you folks here tonight are Democrats. I think you are. And therefore, most of the things I'll be saying tonight, you'll be partial to what I'm saying. But C-SPAN is also televising this. I think it's going to be taped. It'll be shown three, four days from now. In any event, there'll be people watching on C-SPAN who may not be partial to what I'm saying. So therefore, my remarks tonight are going to be delivered uh, as if I were speaking to a more politically diverse audience, not just the people here uh, in this room. I have long believed that most humans uh, only see what they expect to see, uh, what they want to see, what conventional wisdom tells them to see, not what is right in front of them in its pristine condition. In other words, they only hear the music, not the lyrics of human events. And in this regard, if any of you find it intellectually incongruous and therefore difficult to accept that a president of the United States could do what I say George Bush did, because, well, one would never expect a United States president to do such a thing. In other words, seeing what you expect to see, I say that you will be falling into the same unthinking trap that so many humans do. You have to disabuse yourself of any preconceived notion that you may have that just because George Bush is the president of the United States, he is simply incapable of engaging in conduct that smacks of such great criminality. Because if you take that position, a position that has no foundation in logic, you're not going to be as receptive to the evidence that I present or the common sense inferences I draw from that evidence. For those skeptics who say that to prosecute, anyway, for those skeptics who say that to prosecute, that to prosecute George Bush for murder, to prosecute any American president for murder who takes this nation to war, and to do so in a regular American courtroom, and in the very same way that in some adjacent courtroom, a criminal defendant is being prosecuted for murdering a liquor store proprietor during the perpetration of a robbery is just too revolutionary a notion to be viable. I say this, since a regular courtroom is the only place a president such as Bush can be prosecuted for murder, you therefore, if you take that position, if you maintain that position, you must be willing to say then that if a president takes this nation to war under false pretenses, even those hypothetically as base as for his own personal gain, and thousands of Americans get killed, 50 million Americans are killed, other than removing him from office through the impeachment process, he should be completely immune from all criminal responsibility and punishment not even one day in the county jail, and should be able to go on with his life. Now, unless you are willing to say this, and if you do, you're going to sound awfully foolish, <laughs> then you likewise must learn to accept and live with this revolutionary notion. Why? Because there's no third alternative. So although Bush supporters can argue that Bush should not be prosecuted because they don't think he did anything wrong, they cannot legitimately say that he should not be prosecuted if he has done what I say he did. 
To say that is to admit that you have no respect at all for our American system of justice and democracy, that you would prefer that presidents have the same rights and protections as tyrannical uh, dictators like Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Saddam Hussein. I want to state that in writing this book, my motivation was not political. Whether I'm giving a final summation to the jury or writing one of my true crime books, credibility has always meant everything to me. Therefore, my only master, my only mistress are the facts and objectivity. And this is why I can give you a 100% guarantee that if a Democratic president had done what I'm very, very convinced that George Bush did, I would have written the same identical book. Before I get into some of the law, before I get into some of the law applicable to this case and some of the irrefutable evidence that Bush could not get around at his trial, I'd like to touch on some preliminary matters. One is that although millions, perhaps billions, of very harsh, highly uh, condemnatory words have been said and written about George Bush throughout the past seven years, none of which, by the way, he could possibly care any less about. So the words are meaningless. Up to now, other than talk, no one has done anything at all, anything to George Bush. No impeachment, uh, no investigation of him, nothing. He's gotten off scot-free so far. But in my book, I put together a legal case against Bush that could result in his being prosecuted for first-degree murder in an American courtroom. <laughs> being blown to pieces by roadside bombs in Iraq, George Bush was having a lot of fun and enjoying life to the fullest. I'm talking about running bicycling, joking with friends, slapping backs, uh, dancing and swiveling his hips like Elvis to blaring music, eating his blueberry pie and hot dogs, almost always seeming to be in the very best of good spirits. Oh, I know that the White House press people say he takes the loss of American lives hard and he suffers, but that's just pure moonshine. That dog will not run. These are just cheap, worthless words. Suffering on one hand, and having fun, joking around, and enjoying life on the other are simply incompatible. They cannot coexist. They are mutually, mutually exclusive. No one has to take my word for this, or the photos in the book which show Bush having a ball throughout the war. Bush himself has had no hesitancy at all in saying things like this over and over again. And while I'm quoting Bush, I'm going to give you a couple quotes of his. I want you to try to imagine in your wildest imagination, Roosevelt, Truman, LBJ, Nixon, during their respective wars, saying things like this. And also, while I'm quoting George Bush's words, I want you to realize, as I'm sure you do, the horror, the sea of blood, the screams that were going on at the very same time that he's uttering these words. Here's Bush. Laura and I are having the time of our lives. It's going to be a perfect day. I'm in a great mood. I'm feeling pretty good about life. With respect to George Bush's remark at a December 2007 White House press conference that he was feeling pretty good about life, here's someone whose war has cost this nation over $1 trillion so far with no end in sight, literally destroyed or virtually destroyed the entire nation of Iraq, and most importantly by far, and it bears repeating, He's directly responsible for over 100,000 precious human beings dying horrible, violent deaths, yet he says he's feeling pretty good about his life? It's too unbelievable for words. In March of 2005, right in the midst of the Iraq War, Mark McKinnon, a Viking friend of Bush, known him for years. In fact, he was Bush's chief media strategist during Bush's 2004 re-election re -election campaign. Here's what Mark McKinnon told the New York Times about Bush, right in the middle of the war. Quote, he's as calm and relaxed and happy as I've ever seen him. 